Later that afternoon, we are in Lord Goring's library. Got my second buttonhole for me, Phipps? Yes, me lord. Rather distinguished thing, Phipps. I am the only person of the smallest importance in London at present who wears a buttonhole. Yes, me lord. I have observed that. You see, Phipps, fashion is what one wears oneself. What is unfashionable is what other people wear. Yes, me lord. Other people are quite dreadful. The only possible society is oneself. Yes, me lord. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance, Phipps. Yes, me lord. Hmm. Don't think I quite like this buttonhole, Phipps. Makes me look a little too old. Makes me almost in the prime of life, eh, Phipps? I don't observe any alteration in your lordship's appearance. You don't, Phipps? No, me lord. But I will speak to the florist. She's had a loss in her family lately. Oh, it is an extraordinary thing about the lower classes in England. They are always losing their relations. Yes, me lord. They are extremely fortunate in that respect. <laughs> Were there any messages for me, Phipps? Three, me lord. Ah. I want my cab round at once. Yes, me lord. Phipps, when did this letter arrive? It was brought by hand just after your lordship went to the club. That will do, Phipps. Hmm. Lady Chilton's handwriting on Lady Chilton's pink note paper. I want you, I trust you, I am coming to you. Gertrude. Oh, poor woman. She has found out everything. Lord Cavisham. Oh, why will parents always appear at the wrong time? Some extraordinary mistake in nature, I suppose. Ah, oh, my dear father, delighted to see you. Uh, take my cloak off. Is it worthwhile, Father? Of course it is worthwhile, sir. Take it off. Now, which is the most um, comfortable chair? That one, Father. That is the one that I always use when I have visitors. Thank, thank you. Uh, there's no, no, no draft in this room, I hope? Of course, Father, there's no draft. Now, I want to have a uh, serious conversation with you, sir. But, Father, it is after seven, and my doctor tells me that I must not have any serious conversation after seven. It makes me talk in my sleep. Talk in your sleep, sir? <laughs> what, what does that matter? You are not married. No, Father, I'm not married. Hmm, and um, um, that is what I have come to talk to you about, sir. Yes, I was afraid of that. Why, when I was your age, sir, I had been an inconsolable widower for uh, three months. And, uh, I, I was already paying my addresses to your admirable mother. <laughs> you, you can't always be living for pleasure. It's high time for you to get married. Uh, you are 34 years of age, sir. Yes, father, but I only admit to 32. 31 and a half when I have a really good buttonhole. Well, you are 34, I tell you. And there is a draft in this room besides, which makes your conduct worse. Why did you tell me there, there was no draft, sir? I, I can feel a draft. I, I feel it distinctly. Quite right, father. There is a most dreadful draft. I will come and see you tomorrow, Father. We can talk over anything you like. No, sir. Um, I have come here with a, 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 a very uh, a definite purpose, and I intend... <laughs> I intend to see it through. Now, now, now put down my cloak, sir. Uh, certainly, Father, but let us go into the smoking room. Your sneezes are quite heart-rending. Well, sir, I, I suppose I, I still have the right to sneeze when I choose. Oh, quite so, Father. I was merely expressing sympathy. Oh, damn sympathy. There's a great deal too much of that sort of thing going on nowadays. I quite agree with you, Father. If there was less sympathy in the world, there would be less trouble in the world. Do you always really understand what you say, sir? Mm. Yes, Father, if I listen attentively. Well, if you listen attentively, well, conceited young puppy. Phipps, there is a lady coming to see me this evening on particular business. Show her into the drawing room when she arrives, you understand? Yes, me lord. It is a matter of the gravest importance, Phipps. I understand, me lord. No one else is to be admitted under any circumstances. I understand, me lord. Ah. That is probably the lady. I shall see her myself. Well, sir, uh, am I to wait attendance on you? In a moment, Father. Do excuse me. Well, remember my instructions, Phipps. Into that room. Yes, me lord. Lord Goring is not here. 
I was told he was at home. His lordship is engaged at present with Lord Caversham, madam. How very silly of him. His lordship told me to ask you, madam, if you would be so kind as to wait in the drawing room for him. His lordship will come to you there. Lord Goring expects me? Yes, madam. Are you quite sure? His lordship told me that if a lady called, I was to ask her to wait in the drawing room. His lordship's directions on the subject were very precise. How thoughtful of him. To expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern intellect. Oh, how dreary a bachelor's drawing room always looks. I shall have to alter all of this. Uh, no, Phipps, I don't care for that lamp. It's far too glaring. Light some candles. Certainly, madam. And I hope the candles have very becoming shades. We've had no complaints about them, madam, as yet. Phipps goes into the drawing room to light the candles, leaving Mrs Cheveley alone in the library where she discovers Lady Chilton's letter, which, dear listener, you would do well to recall, is pink. I wonder what woman he is waiting for tonight. It'll be delightful to catch him. Men always look so silly when they are caught. Ooh, a letter. I want you. I trust you. I am coming to you, Gertrude. I want you. I trust you. I am coming to you. The candles in the drawing room are lit, madam, as you directed. Thank you. Hurriedly hiding the letter, Mrs Cheveley goes into the drawing room, but immediately Phipps leaves, she returns to the library to retrieve the letter, but on hearing voices retreats back to the drawing room without the letter. My dear father, if I'm to get married, surely you will allow me to choose the time, place and person, particularly the person. That is a matter for me, sir. You, you would probably make a very poor choice. Uh, it is I who should be consulted, not you. Uh, uh, there is property at stake. Uh, it is not a matter for uh, uh, affection. Uh, affection comes later on in married life. Yes. In married life, affection comes when people thoroughly dislike each other, Father, doesn't it? Certainly, sir. I mean, certainly not, sir. You are talking very foolishly tonight. Uh, what I say is that uh, 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 marriage is, is a matter for uh, common sense. So my mother tells me. My dear Arthur, what a piece of good luck meeting you on the doorstep. Your servant had just told me you were not at home. How extraordinary. The fact is, I am horribly busy tonight, Roberts, and I gave orders I was not at home to anyone. Even my father had a comparatively cold reception. He complained of a draught the whole time. Um, uh, not without reason, sir. Uh, good evening. Ah, you must be at home to me, Arthur. You are my best friend. Perhaps by tomorrow you will be my only friend. My wife has discovered everything. Oh, I'd guessed as much. Really? How? Oh, merely by something in the expression of your face as you came in. Uh, who told her? Mrs. Cheveley herself. Oh, I would to God I had died before I had seen so horribly tempted or had fallen so low. You have heard nothing from Vienna yet in answer to your wire? Yes. I got a telegram from the first secretary at eight o'clock tonight. Well? Nothing is absolutely known against her. On the contrary, she occupies a rather high position in society. It is a sort of open secret that Baron Arnheim left her the greater portion of his in immense fortune. Beyond that, I can learn nothing. She doesn't turn out to be a spy then. Oh, spies are of no use nowadays. Their profession is over. The newspapers do their work instead. Arthur, I'm parched with thirst. May I ring for something? Some hock and seltzer? Certainly. Let me. Thanks. I don't know what to do, Arthur. I don't know what to do. I can trust you absolutely, can't I? My dear Robert, of course. Oh, bring some hock and seltzer. Yes, me lord. And Phipps? Yes, me lord. Will you excuse me for a moment, Robert? I want to give some directions to my servant. Uh, certainly. When that lady calls, tell her that I'm not at home to anyone. Do you understand? The lady's in the drawing room, me lord. You told me to show her into that room, me lord. You did perfectly right. Arthur, tell me what I should do. My life seems to have crumbled about me. Robert, you love your wife, don't you? I love her more than anything else in the world. I used to think ambition the great thing. It is not. Love is the great thing. There is nothing but love, and I love her. But she has found me out, Arthur. 
She has found me out. Has she never in her life done some folly, some indiscretion, that she should not forgive your sin? My wife? Never! She does not know what weakness or temptation is. But your wife will forgive you, Robert. Perhaps at this moment she is forgiving you. She loves you, Robert. Why should she not forgive? God grant it. God grant it. Hot and seltzer, sir. Thank you. Robert, did you come in your carriage? No. I walked from the club. Sir Robert will take my cab, Phipps. Yes, me lord. Robert, you will forgive me if I send you away. Arthur, you must let me stay for five minutes. I have made up my mind what I am going to do tonight in the house. The debate on the Argentine Canal is to begin at eleven. What is that? Nothing. I heard something in the next room. Someone has been listening. No, no, there, there is no one there. There is someone. There are lights in the room and the door is ajar. Arthur, what does this mean? Robert, you are excited, unnerved. I tell you there is no one in that room. Do you give me your word that there is no one there? Yes. Your word of honour? Yes. Arthur, let me see for myself. No, no. If there is no one there, why should I not look in that room? Robert, this must stop. I have told you that there is no one in that room. That is enough. It is not enough. For God's sake, don't! There is someone there, someone whom you must not see. Ah, I thought so. I forbid you to enter that room. Stand back. I will know who it is. What explanation have you to give me for the presence of that woman here? Robert, I swear to you on my honour that that lady is stainless and guiltless of all offence towards you. She is a vile and infamous thing. Don't say that, Robert. It was for your sake she came here. It was to try and save you so she came here. She loves you and no one else. You are mad. What have I to do with her intrigues with you? Let her remain your mistress. You are well suited to each other. It's not true, Robert. Before heaven it is not true. Let me pass, sir. You have sworn enough upon your word of honour. Upon Sir Robert's departure, Lord Goring rushes to the drawing room, expecting, not unreasonably, to see Lady Chilton. Good evening, Lord Goring. This is Chiefly. Great heavens. May I ask what you are doing in my drawing room? Merely listening. I have a perfect passion for listening through keyholes. One always hears such wonderful things through them. Doesn't that sound rather like tempting Providence? No, oh, surely Providence can resist temptation by this time. I'm glad you have called. I'm going to give you some good advice. Oh, pray don't. One should never give a woman anything that she can't wear in the evening. I see you're as quite willful as you used to be. Ooh, far more. I have greatly improved. I have had more experience. Too much experience is a dangerous thing. Pray, have a cigarette. Half the pretty women in London smoke cigarettes. Personally, I prefer the other half. Mm, thanks. I never smoke. My dressmaker wouldn't like it, and a woman's first duty in life is to her dressmaker, isn't it? What the second duty is, no one has as yet discovered. You have come here to sell me Robert Chilton's letter, haven't you? To offer it to you on conditions. How did you guess that? Because you haven't mentioned the subject. Have you got it with you? Oh, no. A well-made dress has no pockets. What is your price for it? Oh, how absurdly English you are. The English think that a chequebook can solve every problem in life. Why, my dear Arthur, I have very much more money than you have, and quite as much as Robert Chilton has got hold of. Money is not what I want. What do you want, then, Mrs Cheveley? Why don't you call me Laura? I don't like the name. You used to adore it. Yes, that's why. Oh, Arthur, you loved me once. Yes. And you asked me to be your wife. That was the natural result of my loving you. And you threw me over because you saw... Or you said you saw poor old Lord Mortlake trying to have a violent flirtation with me in the conservatory at Denby. I am under the impression that my lawyer settled that matter with you on certain terms, dictated by yourself. At that time I was poor, and you were rich. Quite so. That is why you pretended to love me. You were silly, Arthur. Lord Mortlake was never anything more to me than an amusement. I loved you, Arthur. My dear Mrs Cheveley. You have always been far too clever to know anything about love. I did love you, and you loved me. I suppose that when a man has once loved a woman, he will do anything for her, except continue to love her? Yes, except that. Oh, I am tired of living abroad. I want to come back to London. I want to have a charming house here. I want to have a salon. If one could only teach the English how to talk and the Irish how to listen, society here would be quite civilised. Besides, I have arrived at the romantic stage. 
when I saw you last night at the Chilterns, I realised that you were the only person that I had ever cared for, if I have ever cared for anybody, Arthur. And so, on the morning of the day that you marry me, I will give you Robert Chilton's letter. That is my offer. I will give it to you now, if you promise to marry me. Now? Tomorrow. Are you really serious? Yes, quite serious. I should make you a very bad husband. I don't mind bad husbands. I've had two. They amused me immensely. You mean that you amuse yourself immensely, don't you? What do you know about my married life? Oh, nothing. But I can read it like a book. What book? A book of numbers. Do you think it is quite charming of you to be so rude to a woman in your own house? In the case of very fascinating women, sex is a challenge, not a defence. I suppose that is meant for a compliment. My dear Arthur, women are never disarmed by compliments. Men always are. That is the difference between the two sexes. Women are never disarmed by anything, as far as I know them. Then are you going to allow your greatest friend, Robert Chilton, to be ruined, rather than marry someone who really has considerable attractions left? Is that how you men stand up for each other? It is infinitely preferable to the war you women wage against each other. I only wage war against one woman, against Gertrude Chilton. I hate her. I hate her now more than ever. Because you have brought a real tragedy into her life, I suppose. Oh, there is only one real tragedy in a woman's life. The fact that her past is always her lover, and her future invariably her husband. Lady Chilton knows nothing of the kind of love to which you are alluding. Well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview may be regarded as at an end. You admit it was romantic, don't you? For the privilege of being your wife, I was ready to surrender a great prize, the climax of my diplomatic career. You decline. Very well. If Sir Robert doesn't uphold my Argentine scheme, then I expose him. Voila! Do you mustn't do that. It would be vile, horrible, infamous. No, oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. It is a commercial transaction. If he won't pay me my price, then he will have to pay the world a greater price. There is no more to be said. I must go. Goodbye. Won't you shake hands? With you? No. You went this afternoon to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in the world to degrade her husband in her eyes, to try and kill her love for him. That I cannot forgive. Arthur, you are unjust to me. I didn't go to taunt Gertrude. I called with Lady Markby to see if an ornament, a, a jewel that I had lost last night, had been found at the Chilterns. A diamond snake brooch with rubies? <laughs> yes. How do you know? Because it is found. In point of fact, I found it myself, and I foolishly forgot to tell the butler anything about it as, as I was leaving. This is the brooch, is it not? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad to get it back. It was, it, it was a present. Won't you wear it? Well, certainly, if you'll pin it on. Why do you put it on as a bracelet? I, I never knew it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? No. Well, it looks very well on me as a bracelet, doesn't it? Yes. Much better than when I last saw it. And when did you see it last? Oh, ten years ago. On my cousin, Lady Berkshire, from whom you stole it. What do you mean? I mean that you stole that ornament from my cousin, Mary Berkshire, to whom I gave it when she was married. I recognised it last night. I determined to say nothing about it till I'd found the thief. It is not true. Of course it's true. Why, thief is written across your face at this moment. I will deny the whole affair from beginning to end. I will say that I've never seen this wretched thing and it was never in my possession. No oh, damnation! Mrs. Cheveley tries but fails to take off the bracelet. The drawback of stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheveley, is that one never knows how wonderful the thing that one steals is. You can't get that bracelet off unless you know where the spring is. It is rather difficult to find. I gave the jeweller particular instructions. Brute! You coward! Oh, don't use big words. They mean so little. Oh! <sighs> what are you going to do? I am going to ring for my servant. He is an admirable servant. Always comes in the moment one rings for him. When he comes, I will tell him to fetch the police. The police? What for? Tomorrow the Berkshires will prosecute you. That is what the police are for. Don't! Do that? I will do anything you want. Anything in the world you want. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. Stop. Stop. Let me have time to think. Give me Robert Chilton's letter. I have not got it with me. I'll give it to you tomorrow. You know you are lying. Give it to me at once. This is it. Yes. For so well-dressed a woman, Mrs. Cheveley. 
You do have moments of the most admirable common sense. Lord Goring reads Sir Robert's self-incriminating letter and burns it. And now, will you get me my cloak? With pleasure. While he is gone, Mrs Cheveley remembers and finally steals Lady Chiltern's letter to Lord Goring. Thank you. I promise that I will never try to harm Robert Chiltern again. Fortunately, you have not the chance, Mrs Cheveley. Even had I the chance, I wouldn't do it. On the contrary, I'm going to render him a great service. I'm charmed to hear it. Why, this is a reformation. Yes. I can't bear so upright a gentleman, so honourable an English gentleman, so shamefully deceived. And so... I find that Gertrude Chilton's dying speech and confession has somehow strayed into my pocket. What do you mean? I am going to send Robert Chilton the love letter that his wife wrote to you tonight. Love letter? I want you. I trust you. I am coming to you, Gertrude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wretched woman! Must you always be thieving? Give me back that letter. You shall not leave my room till I have got it. Lord Goring merely rang that you should show me out. Good night, Lord Goring. We are back in Sir Robert's morning room. It is early evening. It is a great nuisance. I can't find anyone in this house to talk to, and I'm full of interesting information. I feel like the latest edition of something or other. Sir Robert is still at the Foreign Office, my lord. Lady Chilton is not down yet. Her ladyship has not yet left her room. Miss Chilton has just come in from riding. Ah, that is something. Lord Cavendish has been waiting some time in the library for Sir Robert. I told him your lordship was here. Thank you. Would you kindly tell him I've gone? I shall do so, my lord. Really, I don't want to meet my father three days running. This is a great deal too much excitement for any son. I hope to goodness he won't come in. Lord Caversham. Well, well, sir, what are you doing here? Wasting your time as usual, I suppose. My dear father, when one pays a visit, it is for the purpose of wasting other people's time, not one's own. Now, uh, uh, have you been thinking over what I spoke to you about last night? I've been thinking about nothing else. Engaged to be married yet? Not yet, but I hope to be before lunchtime. You can have till dinner time if it would be of any convenience to you. <laughs> Thanks awfully. But I think I'd sooner be engaged before lunch. <laughs> I uh, never know whether you're serious or not. Neither do I, Father. Anyway, uh, have you read the Times today? Uh, the leading article on Sir Robert Chilton's uh, career. Good heavens. No. What does it say? What does it say, sir? Well, uh, everything complimentary, of course. Uh, Chilton's speech last night on this, um, what do you call it, Argentine Canal scheme, uh, 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 it was one of the finest pieces of oratory ever delivered in the house since, uh, uh, since, since Canning. Ah, oh, never heard of Canning. Never wanted to. But did Robert uphold the scheme? Uphold it, sir? <laughs> About how little you know him. No, sir. He denounced it roundly. And, and the whole system of modern political finance. Uh, let me read it to you. Uh, Sir Robert uh, Chilton, blah, 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 the, the most rising of our young statesmen, uh, the, the brilliant uh, orator, uh, uh, unblemished career, uh, his well-known integrity of character, uh, uh, oh, here we go. represents all that, that is best in English public life. Uh, they will never say that of you, sir. I sincerely hope not, Father. However, I am delighted at what you tell me about Robert, thoroughly delighted. It shows he's got pluck. Well, he's got more than pluck, sir. He's got, uh, um, 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 genius. Ah, I prefer pluck. It is not so common nowadays as genius is. Uh, I wish you would go into Parliament. My dear father, only people who look dull ever go into the House of Commons, and only people who are dull ever succeed there. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you try to do something useful in life? Why don't you propose to that, uh, that pretty Miss Chilton, uh, don't suppose there is the smallest chance for accepting you. Uh, 
You don't deserve her. My dear father, if we men married the women we deserved, we should have a very bad time of it. How do you do, Lord Caversham? I hope, to, hope Lady Caversham is quite well. But Lady Caversham is as usual, as usual. Good morning, Miss Mabel. And Lady Caversham's bonnets, are they at all better? They have had a serious relapse, I am sorry to say. <clears throat> Good morning, Miss Mabel. Oh, are you here? Of course you understand that after your breaking your appointment, I am never going to speak to you again. Do you think you could possibly make your son behave a little better occasionally, just as a change? I regret to say, Miss Chilton, that I have no influence at all over, over my son. Uh, I, I wish I had. If I had, I know what I would make him do. <laughs> now, I really must bid you good morning. I only dropped in to congratulate Sir Robert on his speech. Oh, I hope you're not going to leave me all alone with Lord Goring, especially at such an early hour of the day. I am afraid I can't take him with me to Downing Street. Uh, it is not the Prime Minister's day for seeing the unemployed. People who don't keep their appointments in the park are horrid. Estable. I'm glad you admit it, but I wish you would not look so pleased about it. I can't help it. I always feel pleased when I'm with you. Then I suppose it is my duty to remain with you. Of course it is. Well, my duty is a thing I never do on principle. It always depresses me. So I'm afraid I must leave you. Please don't, Miss Mabel. I have something very particular to say to you. Oh, is it a proposal? Um, well, yes, it is. I'm bound to say it is. Oh, I'm so glad. That makes a second today. A second today? What conceited ass dare propose to you before I propose to you? Tommy Trafford, of course. It is one of Tommy's days for proposing. He always proposes on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the season. You didn't accept him, I hope. I make it a rule never to accept Tommy. That is why he goes on proposing. Oh, bother Tommy Trafford. Tommy is a silly little ass. I love you. I know. And I think you might have mentioned it before. I'm sure I've given you heaps of opportunities. Mabel, do be serious. Please, be serious. Ah, that is the sort of thing a man always says to a girl before he has been married to her. He never says it afterwards. Mabel, I have told you that I love you. Can't you love me a little in return? You silly Arthur. If you knew anything about anything which you don't, you would know that I adore you. Everyone in London knows it except you. It is a public scandal the way I adore you. I have been going about for the last six months telling the whole of society that I adore you. I wonder you consent to have anything to say to me. I have no character left at all. At least, I feel so happy. I'm quite sure I have no character left at all. Yeah. Do you know I was awfully afraid of being refused? But you have never been refused yet by anybody, have you, Arthur? I can't imagine anyone refusing you. Of course. I'm not nearly good enough for you, Mabel. I'm so glad, darling. I was afraid you were. And I'm... I'm a little over 30. Dear, you look weeks younger than that. How sweet of you to say so. And it is only fair to tell you frankly that I'm fearfully extravagant. But so am I, Arthur. So we're sure to agree. And now I must go and tell Gertrude. Uh, really? Yes. Will you tell her that I want to talk to her? I've been waiting to speak to her or Robert all morning. Do you mean to say that you didn't come here expressly to propose to me? No. That was a flash of genius. Your first. And my last. I'm delighted to hear it. Now, don't stir. I'll be back in five minutes. And don't fall into any temptations while I'm away. Dear Mabel, while you're away, there are none. It makes me horribly dependent on you. Good morning, dear. How pretty you are looking. How fine you are looking, Gertrude. It is most becoming. Good morning, Lord Goring. Good morning, Lady Chilton. I shall be in the conservatory under the second palm tree on the left. Lady Chilton, I have a certain amount of very good news to tell you. Mrs Cheagley gave me up Robert's letter last night and I burned it. Robert is safe. Safe? Oh, I am so glad of that. Oh, what a good friend you are to him, to us. There is only one person now that could be said to be in any danger. Who is that? Yourself. I? In danger? What do you mean? Lady Chilton, yesterday you wrote me a very beautiful, womanly letter asking for my help. You wrote to me as one of your oldest friends, one of your husband's oldest friends. Mrs Cheveley stole that letter from my room. Well, what use is it to her? Why should she not have it? Lady Chilton, I'll be quite frank with you. Mrs. Cheveley puts a certain construction on that letter and proposes to send it to your husband. But what construction could she put on it? Oh, not that. Not that. If I, in, in trouble and wanting your help, trusting you, propose to come to you, 
Are there women so horrible as that? Lady Chilson, let us tell Robert everything at once. You want me to tell Robert that I wrote to you a note? I think it's better that he should know the exact truth. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't. May I do it? No. You are wrong, Lady Chilson. No. The letter must be intercepted. That is all. How can I do it? I dare not ask the servants to bring me his letters. Do his secretaries open his letters? Yes. Uh, Who is with him today? Mr Trafford, isn't it? Yes. Tommy would do anything for you, wouldn't he not? I think so. Your letter was on pink paper. He could recognise it without reading it, couldn't he? By the colour? I suppose so. Is he in the house now? Yes. I will go to him and I will ask him to stop the letter from reaching Sir Robert on pink paper. Oh! Robert is coming with the letter in his hand. It has reached him already. I want you. I trust you. I am coming to you. Gertrude. Oh, my love, is this true? If so, then it was for me to come to you. This letter of yours, Gertrude, makes me realise that nothing that the world may do can hurt me now. You want me, Gertrude? Lord Goring secretly signals to Lady Chilton to forgive her husband. Yes. You trust me, Gertrude? Yes. Why did you not add that you loved me? Because I loved you. Lord Goring has business to attend to in the conservatory, leaving Sir Robert and Gertrude alone. Gertrude, you don't know what I feel. When Trafford passed me your letter across the table, he had opened it by mistake, and I read it. Oh, I did not care what disgrace or ruin was in store for me. I only thought you loved me still. There is no disgrace in store for you, nor any public shame. Mrs. Cheveley has handed over to Lord Goring the document that was in her possession, and he has destroyed it. Are you sure of this, Gertrude? Yes, Lord Goring just told me. So that's what was happening last night? Then I am safe. For two days I've lived in terror, but now I'm safe. How did Arthur destroy the letter? Tell me. He burned it. I wish I had seen that. How many men would love to see their past burning to ashes before them. Is Arthur still here? Yes, he is in the conservatory. I am so glad now I made that speech last night in the house. So glad. I made it thinking that public disgrace might be the result, but it has not been so. Public honour has been the result. I think so. I fear so, almost. For although I am safe from detection, although every proof against me is destroyed, I suppose, Gertrude, I should retire from public life. Oh yes, Robert, you should do that. It is your duty to do that. It is much to surrender. No, it will be much to gain. And you would be happy living somewhere alone with me, abroad perhaps, or in the country away from London, away from public public life? You would have no regrets. Oh, none, Robert. And your ambition for me. You used to be ambitious for me. Oh, my ambition. I have none now, but that we two may love each other. Let us talk no more about ambition. Lord Goring returns from the conservatory and he is not alone. I don't think your conversation is at all. Oh, my darling. What does this mean? It means that this charming, foolish young lady has been clever enough to accept me. Oh, congratulations, Arthur. Arthur, my best wishes to you both. I have to thank you for what you have done for me. I don't know how I can repay you. My dear fellow, I'll tell you at once. Lord Caversham. That admirable father of mine really makes a habit of turning up at the wrong moment. Uh, Good morning, Lady Chilton. Warmest congratulations to you, Chilton, uh, on your brilliant speech last night. Um, I have just left the Prime Minister, and you are to have the vacant seat in the Cabinet. A seat in the cabinet? Yes, yes, look look here. Here's the Prime Minister's letter. A seat in the cabinet? Certainly. Um, and you, you, you well deserve it, too. Uh, you have got what we want uh, so much in political life nowadays. Um, a high character, a high moral tone and high principles. Uh, yes, uh, but, but everything that you have not got, sir, and... Uh, well, you never will. I don't like principles, Father. I prefer prejudices. I cannot accept this offer, Lord Caversham. I have made up my mind to decline it. Decline it, sir? My intention is to retire at once from public life. Well, um, 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 but we, we decline a seat in the cabinet and uh, I, I, I retire from public life? Well, I've, uh, I've never heard such damn nonsense in the whole course of my existence. Uh, 
I beg your pardon, Lady Chilton. Uh, don't grin like that. No, Father. L L Lady Chilton, you, you, uh, you are a sensible woman, the, the most sensible woman in London, the, the, the most sensible woman that I know. Uh, would you kindly prevent your husband from making such a, uh, uh, from taking such a, uh, uh, will you kindly do that, Lady Chilton? I think my husband is right in his determination, Lord Caversham. I approve of it. You approve of it? Oh, good heaven. I admire him immensely for it. I have never admired him so much before. He is finer than ever I thought him. You will go and write your letter to the Prime Minister now, won't you? Don't hesitate about it, Robert. I suppose I had better write it at once. I will ask you to excuse me for a moment, Lord Caversham. I may come with you, Robert, may I not? Yes, Gertrude. What is the matter with his family? Something wrong here, eh? Oh, idiocy. Uh, hereditary, I suppose. Both of them, too. The wife as well as husband. Very, very sad. Very sad indeed. It is not idiocy, Father, I assure you. Oh, what is it then? Well, it is what is called nowadays a high moral tone, Father. That is all. I hate these newfangled names. Uh, same thing as we used to call idiocy uh, 50 years ago. I I'm, I'm shan't stay in this house any longer. Oh, just go in here for a moment, Father. Uh, what, sir? I beg your pardon, Father, I forgot. The conservatory, Father. There is someone there I want you to talk to. What about, sir? About me, Father. Uh, well, not, not a subject on which much eloquence is possible. No, Father. But the lady is like me. She doesn't care much for eloquence in others. Lady Chilton? Why are you playing Mrs. Cheveley's cards? I, I don't understand you. Mrs. Cheveley made an attempt to ruin your husband, either to drive him from public life or to make him adopt a dishonourable position. Why should you do him the wrong Mrs. Cheveley tried to do and failed? Lord Goring. Lady Chilton, allow me. You wrote me a letter last night in which you said you trusted me and wanted my help. Now is the moment when you really want my help. Now is the time when you have got to trust me, to trust in my counsel and judgment. You love Robert. Do you want to kill his love for you? What sort of existence will he have if you rob him of the fruits of his ambition? If you take him from the splendor of a great political career, he who was made for triumph and success? Don't make this terrible mistake, Lady Chilton. But it is my husband himself who wishes to retire from public life. He feels it is his duty. It was he who first said so. Rather than lose your love, Robert would do anything. Wreck his whole career, as he is on the brink of doing now. He is making for you a terrible sacrifice. Take my advice, Lady Chilton, and do not accept a sacrifice so great. Besides, Robert has been punished enough. We have both been punished. I set him up too high. Do not for that reason set him down now too low. Your husband's life is at this moment in your hands. Your husband's love is in your hands. Gertrude, here is the draft of my letter. Shall I read it to you? Let me see it. What are you doing? Your life is more important than this. Lord Goring has made me understand. I will not spoil your life for you, nor see you spoil it as a sacrifice to me. Gertrude! Gertrude! Arthur, it seems that I am always to be in your debt. Oh dear, no, Robert. Your debt is to Lady Chilton, not to me. I owe you much. And now tell me what you were going to ask me just now as Lord Caversham came in. Robert, you are your sister's guardian, and I want your consent to my marriage with her. Oh, I am so glad. I am so glad. Thank you, Lady Chilton. My sister to be your wife? Yes. Arthur, I am very sorry, but the thing is quite out of the question. I have to think of Mabel's future happiness, and I don't think her happiness would be safe in your hands. But I love Mabel. No other woman has any place in my life. Robert, if they love each other, why should they not be married? Arthur cannot bring Mabel the love that she deserves. What reason have you for saying that? Do you really require me to tell you? Certainly I do. As you choose. When I called on you yesterday evening, I found Mrs. Cheveley concealed in your rooms. I know you were engaged to be married to her once. The fascination she exercised over you then seems to have returned. You spoke to me last night of her as of a woman whom you respected and honoured. That may be so, but I cannot give my sister's life into your hands. It would be wrong of me. It would be unjust, infamously unjust to her. I have nothing more to say. Robert, it was not Mrs. Cheveley whom Lord Goring expected last night. Not Mrs. Cheveley? Who was it then? Lady Chilton. It was your own wife. 
Robert, yesterday afternoon, Lord Goring told me that if ever I was in trouble, I could come to him for help, as he was our oldest and best friend. Later on, after that terrible scene in this room, I wrote to him telling him that I trusted him, that I had need of him, that I was coming to him for help and advice. Yes, that letter. I didn't go to Lord Goring's after all. Mrs. Cheveley went instead. She stole my letter and sent it anonymously to you this morning. That you should think... Oh, Robert, I cannot tell you what she wished you to think. What? Had I fallen so low in your eyes that you thought that even for a moment I could have doubted your goodness? Oh, Gertrude! Arthur, you can go to Mabel, and you have my best wishes. Lord Goring, I think your father's conversation much more improving than yours. I'm only going to talk to Lord Caversham in the future, and always in the conservatory. Darling. What does this mean, sir? You don't mean to say that this charming, clever young lady has been foolish as to accept you? Certainly, father. And Chilton's been wise enough to accept the seat in the cabinet. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that, Chilton. I, I, I congratulate you, sir. If, if the country doesn't go to the dogs or the radicals, we shall have you as prime minister someday. Luncheon is on the table, my lady. You'll stop to luncheon, Lord Caversham, won't you? Uh, w with pleasure. And I'll drive you down to Downing Street afterwards, Chilton. You have a great future before you, a great future. Wish I could say the same for you, sir. But your career will have to be entirely domestic. Yes, father. I prefer it domestic. And if you don't make this young lady an ideal husband, I'll cut you off with a shilling. An ideal husband? Oh, I don't think I should like that. It sounds like something in the next world. What do you want him to be then, dear? He can be whatever he chooses. All I want is to be a real wife to him. Upon my word, there is a good deal of common sense in that, Lady Chilton. And with that, everyone departs, leaving Sir Robert alone with his thoughts, which are gently interrupted by his returning wife. Aren't you coming in, Robert? Gertrude, is it love you feel for me, or is it pity merely? It is love, Robert. Love and only love. For both of us, a new life is beginning. You have been listening to the Roundel Players production of An Ideal Husband by Oscar Wilde. In order of appearance, the cast were Mrs. Marchmont, Kate Peters, Lady Basildon, Faye Bedding, Mason, Mel Pazowski, Lord Caversham, Steve Hemsley, Lady Chilton, Rachel Rose, Mabel Chilton, Eleanor Bell, Lady Markby, Miss Portlock, Mrs. Cheveley, Sarah Lacey, Viscomte de Nanyak, Tim Hansel, Sir Robert Chilton, Zach Thraves, Lord Goring, Dan Butler, Phipps, John Ewans. An Ideal Husband was recorded and engineered by Alaric Smith. The music composed by Andy Leggett and the director was Diona Fun. It is a Roundel Players production. <laughs>